My name's Marcus de Sotoy. I'm the Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford. And I'm also an author of a new book called The Creativity Code. If you've been following the news, you hear a lot of things about AI, um, writing books, um, writing music, painting, AI kind of doing things that we would call creative. So, so what's that all about? Well, the book was sort of sparked by um, this kind of existential fear, I think, that we all have at the moment, that um, AI seems to be becoming so powerful that it's just going to be doing all the things that uh, that we do, and taking our jobs, for example. And doing um, it better than we do. And possibly doing it better, exactly. Um, and I think many people regard um, the creative arts, um, you know, as you say, painting, writing music, writing novels, that that's an expression of what it means to be human. So surely um, this is something AI could never be able to do. Um, but because we've produced a lot of data, and that's where AI is being very successful by actually analysing data, understanding the patterns inside that data, that maybe it can learn from our art and actually produce, as you say, uh, a great piece of uh, music or uh, a masterpiece or or maybe even uh, even a novel how far are we down that road are we at a stage where we can say that ai is doing things that we would regard as creative or is that just hype well i think it's important to define what creative is because uh, it's one of those words which is uh, sometimes a little hard to pin down i found a quite useful definition that margaret bowden gave and she said well uh, you can create call a creative act if it's if it's novel if it's surprising to us and it has some sort of value. Um, now, novelty is something you can judge quite objectively, I think. Um, but of course, surprise and value are very subjective. So the AI has got to sort of learn the things that we find surprising, the things that uh, we regard as having value. In the past, AI had real problems with vision. And that was regarded as something that the human brain was incredibly good at, um, just taking the huge onslaught of visual data and, and interpreting it and understanding what was in there. And uh, traditionally, AI was very bad at this. It couldn't integrate all the pixels into a coherent story. But there's been a real change in the AI that we're seeing at the moment, where the code is actually not set in stone at the beginning, but can adapt and change and re-parameterize itself, something we call machine learning. It provides an environment for the code to learn itself by interacting with data. And there's some interesting examples of something called a creative adversarial network, which is actually two algorithms working sort of um, creatively together or maybe against each other. It's a little bit like a game where one algorithm is tasked with learning the art of the past and then producing something which doesn't fit into any pattern mm -hmm. to date. So it's really trying to make something new. But it can't be so new that the thing is just not recognisable as art. So the second algorithm is the discriminator and says either that you haven't gone far enough or you've gone too far. And this has actually created some art which when shown at Basel Art Fair, um, people weren't told that it was created by a computer, but they had quite a large emotional reaction to these paintings and were surprised in retrospect when they were told this was actually created by these mm. algorithms kind of competing against each other to make something new. Surely, um all that AI can do. If it's looking at loads of data, it's taking the data from the past. All it can produce really is just a pastiche of what's gone before. So that's saying... really not true. And I think that's um, most people's hope is that all it's going to be doing is, is pastiches. And actually, it's, the point is that you can write code which is asking uh, the, uh, the, the AI to actually produce something new or break the rules. Um, so that's because in the book, I actually talk about three sorts of creativity. Um, exploratory creativity, which is a little bit similar to what you've just said, which you understand the rules of the game and you just push them to the extreme. And there's an interesting example of that actually um, in jazz music where um, Francois Paché at Sony produced something called the Jazz Continuator, which learned on the jazz riffs of a pianist, but then pushed them and showed the jazz pianist so much more that he could do with his world. So I think that's an example, not of pastiche, but actually pushing the rules of the game. Then there's combinational creativity, which is combining two styles which seem to have nothing to do with each other and making something new. Um, but I think the really challenging one is this transformational creativity, where something seems to come out of nothing, where you break the rules. Picasso, it's just, where did that come from? Now it did come from something, and that's the point. We, we sort of try, actually 
kind of uh, put a kind of mystique around creativity that it is something mysterious that you can't understand. Actually, very often it's something about our subconscious which is being realized in the art, but often there are rules and algorithms, and maybe it's about breaking a rule. Well, you can tell an, uh, an algorithm to look for rules to break, to make something new which isn't just pastiche. Is that what you mean when you, I think you said at, at, at time, you say in the book that one of the value of, a, of, of this sort of work is not so much making machines that are creative, but stopping humans be thinking so much like machines along the same lines all I, the time. I, exactly. The evidence is that the AI that we're creating is going to push us creatively as humans. We very much get stuck in ways of behaving, rules and beha beha behaving very mechanically. And the AI is going to offer us kind of ideas to push us out of that uh, mm -hmm. comfort zone into somewhere new. I guess that does all sound very positive and, and, as you say, very different from the normal dystopian narrative about AI. But I still wonder, the, the point, surely the point about human creativity is, as I think you said, we, we express something in ourselves. And can an AI really do that? Can it really have, is it, does it have an essence of, for want of a better word, soul? Surely all it's got is the intentions of whoever programmed it. I, I think this is, you've uh, really hit on an important point here, which is intention. Where is the intention coming from? The AI doesn't sort of have a, a need to express itself at the moment. That is, is being put in there by the human. And certainly the AI is producing things that the human wasn't expecting, and the code is evolving, developing such that it's getting a sort of autonomy separate from the coder. But you're absolutely right. It, it, is it really expressing something internally? Well, to a certain extent, I argue that yes it is. It's not expressing a soul yet, yet, um, or consciousness, but I think that the code is actually evolving and developing and becoming almost independent of the coder, such we don't really understand necessarily how the code is making its decisions. Um, that's one of the problems with machine learning, is that um, after a while the, the decision tree inside the code is so complex we really don't understand how and why it's making its decisions. So I think that actually it's art can weirdly give us some sort of access to that internal world in a similar way to we use art to get inside the mind of another. And I think that's why one of the most interesting visual art examples in the book um, actually comes from Deep Dream when Google turned its vision recognition software sort of on itself and said, OK, I'm going to give you a random load of pixels. I want you just to dial up what you see in these random pixels. You know, I like the games when we play, we look in the clouds and we see mm. a, a dragon there or a snake. And that actually gave us an extraordinary insight into how the visual recognition software was seeing the world, how it had learned, what it had learned on. Um, for example, if you give it sort of random pixels, a huge amount of kind of animals start appearing in this world because we realize it's learned on many pictures of animals as data for its learning process. But it also helps us to pick up biases. So for example, there was one image where a lot of um, images of dumbbells started appearing, but the dumbbells would always appear with an arm connected to them, mm -hmm. which made us realize this uh, has only learnt on images of dumbbells which are being held by humans. And so it doesn't realize that a dumbbell can be an independent uh, you know, independent from human anatomy. And I think this is really important going forward because algorithms, people tend to think are value free, but because we're giving them data to learn on, they're actually, they're beginning to become biased. And there's a very interesting example. I was, did an event with a woman from MIT Media Lab. She's a roboticist. And when she was in front of a robot, the robot wouldn't recognize she was in front of it. Why? Because she was black. When she put a white mask on, suddenly it recognized she was there. And what she realized when she uh, lifted the bonnet of the AI was that it had learned on lots of pictures of white male faces. So I think, and she started with this wonderful thing called the Algorithmic Justice League, um, which is a great mm. name. But I, but I think that that is part of the point of looking at the art of AI is that, yeah, it's not got a soul yet, but it's got a sort of, well, dare I call it, a sort of subconscious. Why do we need creative AI? Surely we, we create all this stuff 
by humans, for humans, what, what's the point of involving AI in that sort of thing? I think there are many reasons, actually. One is to push our own creativity. So um, the jazz musician who trained with um, an AI jazz improviser um, said, well, you know, this machine has shown me things I, I don't think I would ever have achieved. Some people have said, well, um, isn't that like looking up the answers in the back of the book? Isn't part of the point about being human to struggle towards, you know, if the AI just mm -hmm. tells us all the answers, then what's the point? Um, and that really is interesting because actually I start with the story of the amazing success of AI in playing the game of Go. A game which many people thought would never be able to be played by a computer. But now um, Alpha, Alpha Go, then Alpha Zero, is at a level which far exceeds humans. Right, and you, 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 you tell the story of that amazing Move 37 in that, in that second game between um, the Alpha Go and Lee C. Dole, the human champion, where the AI did something that no one thought possible, everyone was aghast. And I think, yeah. It turned out to be a game changer and won the game. And since then, humans have been exploring the new possibilities that they never thought were there. I think this is why I chose this move um, to, to kind of start the journey of the book, because I think it really qualifies as a creative move. It isn't just doing things uh, sort of uh, like we used to do before. It was a surprise because when the move was played, you never play this move uh, early on in the game. The, the AI suggested uh, placing a stone quite near the center of the board compared to where you usually do. And all of the commentators, I watch this thing obsessively on YouTube, um, worried about my own sort of existential, because I think maths is very like playing Go. And they all said, whoa, it's made a mistake. Lisa Doll's gonna win the game now. Yet, it, so there's the surprise. It was new, but it had value because ultimately, mm -hmm. That stone being there towards the end of the game is what um, gave uh, AlphaGo a huge amount of territory, so it won. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's actually taught us to play the game mm -hmm. in a new way. And one of the kind of images I use quite often in the book um, is that uh, as humans, we've sort of felt like we've reached a peak of achievement. In the game of Go, we had certain ways of playing. It seemed to be the, uh, a, a peak in sort of the landscape of the way to play. And so the AI is kind of clearing the fog around uh, the way we're seeing the world, whether it's in the game of Go or in music or, or visual arts, and is revealing that there's um, a, an actually an even better way or, or more valuable way or, uh, or more interesting way to, to do these things. So I think that's what's exciting is it's, it's revealing new ways of thinking, playing, creating. But there will always be a place for human art and human genius, is what you're saying. I think what's going to protect us is the fact that uh, this AI needs data to train on. It needs a lot of it. To do visual recognition software, mm. it needed millions of images. There aren't that many Rembrandts. There aren't that many pieces by Mozart. Uh, there aren't that many plays even by mm. Shakespeare. And I think the kind of lack of data of these kind of masterpieces is what actually will protect us from AI being able to do something really stupendously exciting. Great. Marcus de Soto, thank you very much. Thank you.